Okay, well, we've got four presentations to get through in this session on non-traditional uh, content, uh, and I propose not to waste any more time. I'd like to introduce Nick Jackson, a developer uh, from the University of Lincoln, um, who's going to be talking to us about dog food and eating it uh, and its relation to API. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Oh, that's loud. Who's feeling a bit worse for wear after last night? Fine, I'll, I'll try to be wonderful and enthusiastic and get you all raring and up on your feet and stuff because this is amazing. So, I've got to say, the technology's broken my presenter notes, so I've got no idea what's coming up, so this could be good fun. But I'm going to talk to you about something which is known as eating your own dog food, which is basically using what you build to build what you're building. In our case, we're using it to build a repository, and we've discovered some fairly interesting things along the way. If anybody wants to read the full paper that this is about, you can go to this wonderful address. It's in a proper repository and everything. So you can download the paper, read it at your leisure, put it on your Kindle, etc., etc. I, as been said, I'm called Nick Jackson. I'm a lead web developer, which isn't as exciting as it sounds. I just develop things on the web. And if you want to get in touch with me or hurl insults, you can tweet me at JacksonJ04. My partner in crime, who co-authored the paper and you may see wandering around, is a Mr. Joss Wynn, who sat down there. He's a senior lecturer and one of those filthy academical types. You can tweet him insults and comments and things at Joss Wynn. So, the question is, what were we trying to do? First of all, we're building a new research data management platform. Starting from scratch, let's see what we can do if we've got a clean slate and no preconceptions about you know, what it is that a repository should be. But the, the focus on research data was particularly important because we've already got repositories that store everything else, but research data is very much uh, in the vogue at the moment, and we're not entirely sure what the best way to handle it is. We we're focusing on the data during the process of research as well, not afterwards. Most repositories are based on the idea that you finish your research, you bundle your data up, and you put it in the repository for people who may be interested to get to later. We thought, that's a bit boring, and there's things that do that. Let's build something that lets the researchers put stuff in there and get it back out again while they're researching. So, ye oldy fashioned repository. Not that there's anything wrong with old fashioned repositories, you understand. They work brilliantly at what they do but they're built on the premise that you put a file in there or a pointer to a file. Often a CSV file, Excel spreadsheet, if you're a bit more exotic, there's binary data blob formats in there. It's all well and good, but only if you want the entire file at once. And we've got some data sets that are running up into the tens of gigabytes. You really don't want to be downloading that all at once. And even if it's split into smaller files, you don't necessarily know which one of the files labeled 1 to 10 contains what you're looking for, so you've got to download them all anyway. They've also generally got fairly limited methods of interfacing with the actual repository itself. Now, most of them, you open up a web browser and you're in the repository, and that's it. If you want to communicate with it, you can put stuff in using S.W.O.R.D. OK, well, that's great. I've put stuff in. Now what? Can I edit it? Now. You can, in some cases, but it's not particularly the cleanest way of doing it. And there's a lot of repository functionality that you just can't get to programmatically. A lot of the really cool stuff that they can do isn't covered by any kind of standard, and people have thought, well, they can just sign into a web browser, click a button, and do it that way. And they also tend to focus a lot on the format, I should say, <laughs> i.e. file type, not if file type, the format of a file, is it a PDF, is it a CSV file, rather than what the data actually is. So you can't do anything too intelligent with it. If you're storing time series data, for example, in a CSV file, it's still ultimately, at the end of the day, a spreadsheet. And there's no inherent knowledge of what it is built into that data, unless somebody is carefully jotted down, this is time series data, and to do something useful with it, you need to put it into something that understands time series data. What we did was decided to be a bit different. We love our back end. Yeah, I knew there'd be a snigger. <laughs> Which means we build the stuff that's really boring first. We're prepared to deal with raw data as 
raw data. Because we don't care what people click in a browser because people can put the data in at a very basic level. We build our APIs first, not the UI, because the UI is fairly secondary. The API is the functionality that sits right at the very bottom level of our repository. We said, right, we're building that first, and we're building it to be accessible over the APIs. And we build good APIs, which people <laughs> want to use. Who has actually looked at the SORD specification? How boring is SORD? How horrible is SORD? How verbose is SORD? And there's a huge swathe of other specifications that are exactly the same. They're very, very powerful. They're built to deal with complicated things. But actually, all you want to do is find out who wrote a paper. And for that, you shouldn't have to make 400 API calls. We also, as the title of our paper suggests, eat our own dog food. We use our own APIs to build the front end. So we've built the underlying core functionality. And that's all well and good. And it provides, at the moment, not an entire set of features, because we're still building it. But all the features that we've got are in the API. And then we decide, well, hang on. People who aren't familiar with the command prompt might want to get to these. So we'll build our front end to talk to our own APIs. And we use all our own documentation. Who has come across something that's got terrible, terrible documentation? There we go. We've got a policy in the, the few people who work on it that we don't, as much as possible, wheel our chairs over and go, oh, no, you just need to do this, this, and this. We say, check the documentation. Because then the person says, I can't. The documentation's useless. Document what you've done so that other people can find out how to use this software. And we found a user, and we make them use things. In our case, we've got a school of engineering. The school of engineering have a huge amount of data that they wanted to do interesting things with. So we said, right, we will build you something that lets you do this. Uh, Joss is using a wonderful phrase, which is, what is it, the minimum viable product, which is the idea that you get out, your first version is the absolute minimum that you need to get something done, and you can build on it from there. A lot of similar projects in the same research data strand have spent a lot of time evaluating every single need. What could happen here? What could happen in this case? What if somebody wants to deposit a fish? Who knows? But the system needs to be able to deal with it, when actually the chances of somebody trying to deposit a smoked haddock are pretty rare. So there's no point trying to build your system to deal with that, because it's never, it's never going to happen. And if it does, you can tackle the problem then. This is a ye olde fashioned application that I said may have the limited ways of interfacing with it. So you've got a database, you strap an application on it, and you put a user there. Now this is fine if you happen to be a flesh and blood person. But if you're trying to access the data programmatically, you've got to sort of pretend to be a person and do horrible screen scrapey things. And nobody likes screen scraping because as soon as somebody updates the software, all the HTML's changed, and you can't get any data out of it again. Now, the way that most people are fixing this is by tacking an API on the end. The problem we found with this is because the API is not at the very heart of the application, the API often only exposes a small subset of what can be done. You, know, you can read a list of items in the repository. Great, can I search them? No, you can't search them. To search them, what you've got to do is pretend to be a user, mungle up a HTML form, and send that in. Now, search is getting a lot better, but there's a huge swathe of things, not just in repositories, but in software all over the place, that you can't do via APIs, especially in the fields of systems administration. If you want to add a new admin user, there's no API call for that. You've got to go in through the database and do it the hardcore way, or go in through a browser. The solution is to do it like this. Expose every single button bit of functionality, slider, view, search function that people could ever want through an API, build that first, and then build the way of doing it on top of that. We also, curiously, completely forget, or encourage people to completely forget as much as possible, the container file format. Storing a CSV is great, as I said earlier, if you want a whole CSV. But research doesn't happen on a whole CSV file. Research tends to happen 
actually on a subset of all the data that you've got. If you have a survey of 20,000 people, you'd not, you may be interested in only 10 of those people or all those people from a certain location. But if you've got to download the whole CSV file every time, it gets a bit boring. It also makes it interesting to cite these sorts of things. So you can say, the data shown in this huge data set shows, like, does it? Which bit? Because there's 400,000 lines here, and I don't know which ones are particularly interesting. So what we did was we gave the researchers a shared, easily usable database. Because ultimately, that's what most data can be stored as especially with our pilot users in our School of Engineering, it's all tabular data, it's all sensor data, it's stuff that we can easily rip out of CSV files, Excel spreadsheets, MATLAB matrices, etc., and store as a sensible format that we can scale easily, we can store easily, it's resilient, and it's queryable. And we use all the APIs we've got to get stuff in and out automatically as much as possible. Who has ever done a survey using SurveyMonkey or SurveyGizmo or anything like that? And out of the end, you get a spreadsheet that you then have to look at and tweak and reorder columns and things. Did you know that you can make those APIs just, they have an API. You can make them put data wherever you want in whatever format you want. So why are you wasting time downloading CSV files? The answer is because there's not something that you can just say, put all the data here, and I'll get back to it at a later point. So we're forgetting the files that people put data in and focusing on the data, which plays really nicely with our API-driven design, because APIs are all about shuttling data around. We make sure it's extensible from day one. Now, repositories are doing really well in this regard against all other kinds of people. So we thought, can we make it even cooler? But yeah, make sure the data is accessible and writable re really easily by everybody. So if you want to take data out, do a little bit of processing on it and push it back in, that's not a problem because we built the architecture, sorry, I'm just going to see how much time I've got left, that can support that kind of thing at the very core of the application. We encourage reusable modularity. Again, in our pilot in the School of Engineering, we discovered there's a lot of things that they do on every bit of data, or a lot of their data, or some of their data, but it's the same functional process. For example, signal processing. Signal processing, uh, low-pass filters, for example, it happens fairly simply. Why can't we make that bit of functionality modular and reusable at a very low data level? So as soon as data turns up, you can shove it through whichever bit of functionality you <coughs> happen to want to run on that data without needing to download a 400 meg CSV file, load it into MATLAB, and run a horrific function on it, and then try and put it back into a repository. And we rely on the things that do things to get things done, which trips over your tongue a bit. But what that means is if there's something out there that already does what we want to do, there's no point replicating it. At the end of a project, a researcher has a big set of research data. And goes, right, we need to get this out there, make sure it's archived for future generations to look at my survey on X, Y, and Z. I'm like, great, we've got something that does that. It's called ePrint, D space, C can insert repository here. So we can use things that are really good at the more traditional side of the repository to do the traditional side of the repository and push the necessary data to them over the wonderful SORD protocol, because that's what they're good at. So why did we bother doing all this instead of just picking a repository off the shelf, installing it, and going, here, we have a research data repository? We make better stuff. We force our APIs to be robust and reliable, because we're using them to do things. We're hitting them constantly every time somebody is using our, our uh, research data repository. So we, we know that they can stand up to the load because we built them to do that. Because if they don't, we'll get annoyed that our own APIs are falling over. And they're reliable. We know how they behave. And we know that they behave in a sane, coherent manner. Because otherwise, we get annoyed 
shout at our own API and then go, hang on, I can fix that. They're also easily implementable by third parties. Because we don't want to deal with horrible verbose XML, and you don't want to deal with horrible verbose XML. So we build APIs that can be quickly harnessed, repurposed, and used by anybody who doesn't happen to have a degree in all kinds of magic, because that's what most of it is. And we expose every single bit of our functionality over the APIs. Like I said earlier, the example of managing admin accounts for a system. We can do that programmatically, which means, oh, which means that we can plug it into everything else we've got. If our institutional role management system says this person is a research administrator, we can very easily build a hook that goes, this person's a research administrator, set them as an admin in um, Orbital. Our error handling is also forced to be consistent and clear. We've all at some point stumbled across something with an arcane error message and gone, what does that mean? Or, worse at all, worse at all, stumbled across something with no error message and gone, well, I know something's gone wrong because it's not done what I expected, but I don't know what. Because APIs all go through a common wrapper, the common wrapper apples, handles things like error handling. And we can handle those in a consistent manner using the same components every single time. It also forces us to make our error messages clear because otherwise we're sat looking at them when we're trying to build something and going, I have no idea what this error message means. And security is forcibly implemented completely across the board. We put security in at the API layer, which means that because every single call goes over the API, every single call is authenticated. If you can't do something, there's no mysterious route that you can take by putting in a secret URL in the web browser because you just don't have permission. And when the, your environment that is the front end tries to do something, the API will go, no, you can't do that because you don't have the permission to do it. We get improved institutional data visibility and improved visibility for the researchers themselves. It lets them find what they want. I've got examples, again, from our wonderful School of Engineering, where the research has gone, ah, I have the data for that. Let me find it. It's somewhere in this nest of folders in a file, in a row, without a label. What they really wanted to do was just type what they're looking for into a search engine. So we can go a step further than that and actually let them query the underlying data however they want. If they want every re result from a specific period of time, they can say, give me results between this period. And they get the data back that they want to do the research on. And they get it back in the format that they want, because we can export it as CSV, we can export it as JSON, we can export it as XML, we can export it, we've even found out, directly to MATLAB over URL. So they don't even have to download a thing. They can just bung a URL into MATLAB, and down it comes. And we get a much better idea of how much stuff there is out there. So we did a, the data assessment framework survey, and people went, I don't know how much data I've got. I've got something. I've got a couple of hard disks and a memory stick. How much is that? You know, we can put an exact figure on it. We can say, you've got this much data. The admin staff love that, because they can find out what they need to do the next time round. They can say, oh, this type of project tends to use X amount of data, so we can build that into our funding planning for the next time round. And we can seamlessly integrate it all with other systems. If a researcher wants to announce what they're doing on our staff directory, because the interface to the research data repository is open, we can do that. We can build the hook in very simply which means that we can get information on what people are doing out there really, really easily without needing to muck around exporting, importing, batch jobs, etc., etc. We can scale it out as much as we want. Because things are loosely coupled and everything communicates over APIs, it doesn't really matter if it's talking to one server or 100 load balance servers. You make an, an API call, and it either works or it doesn't. There's no horrible statefulness because we use RESTful API design. 
So, like I said, we can just <coughs> trust that it will work eventually without having to talk to the same server. And loose coupling means there's no unpicking that we need to do to extend things. We're not running everything on one tightly coupled box. If we want to add another database server, we can plug another database server in, tell the um, application there's another database server, and it just gets on with it. We don't have to muck around opening firewall ports and that sort of thing because it's built to do that by design. We've got a very pretty diagram. Of, we actually knocked this up. It took about 20 minutes. And we can replicate this as many times as we want. But what we didn't do was say, right, we're going to build this and then see if it works. We started with two boxes and scaled the whole thing out to this and back again without ever taking the system offline. There are a few problems to doing it this way, though. It takes time to design the API architecture first. You can't just dump in, jump in and start making things. You need to think about, well, how am I going to handle errors? How is this data actually going to make it from A to B? How do we do authentication? You also end up doubling up some of the development. If you've got to build something in the underlying application, you think, great, I've done it. Oh, wait, I've got to then build something to talk to that API and expose that functionality to the user. So it can feel like you're doing a lot of effort to build very simple things. And the APIs can add a fair amount of overhead if you're using heavy things like XML RPC or, God forbid, SOAP. So you can have a performance hit if your API is not well designed. Now, we tried a number of different methods of doing this. And again, with our School of Engineering, we put in thousands of data points. And it went, I can't do that, and fell over and did horrible things. So we went back, and we improved the API. And now we can shove around two, 3,000 points a second quite happily. That is it. minutes then for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, right, one there. Um, yeah. Anthony Beats from Monash University. Uh, can you talk about some of your current challenges? The current challenges that we find are mostly in terms of uh, actually resourcing the thing, because we're using a lot of fairly cutting edge technologies the scalability that we had was based very much on a cloud architecture. And we find that central IT just isn't geared up to deal with those kind of demands. We say, we, can, we, say we want a new server. They go, right, that's 700 pounds, and we'll have it ready in six months. We go, that's not good enough, because we've got a researcher with 400 gigs of data, and we need it now. So that's one that's particularly annoying. Making the technicians run around. It's deliberate they're doing a tag team. Uh, I'm Martin Dale from Acuity Unlimited. Um, I'm quite interested in how uh, you're looking after the uh, external users and was wondering um, whether there's some way in which you're describing the APIs so that external users don't have to uh, read all the documentation. They wouldn't be able to knock up that diagram in 20 minutes. Um, is there any way in which to, you know, to describing the APIs in some in, in some way so to yeah, aid uh, discovery? Uh, we don't have a discoverability interface, although if there's demand, that's something that could be considered. Uh, what we do that's closest to what you're talking about is we use continuous integration to build all our API documentation at a number of levels, uh, one of which could feasibly become a discovery description. So that means that when we make a code change, all the documentation is updated in one swathe. Um, but no, there's no discovery layer at the moment, although things are fairly well fleshed out in the documentation. It just needs a person to go, this is what I need to do. I've got a question myself, Nick. I mean, you, you talked a lot about scalability there. And, yeah. and my experience with 
attempting to build systems like that with CSV files. That, that, I mean, the scalability in terms of how many files do you have or, or how many things. There are often problems either with things with, with, with thousands of columns or even in some cases with, with, with lots and lots of rows. Would you say there's a, have you encountered limits yet on the size of any individual table that you can deal with comfortably? Uh, we use a database some of you may have heard of called MongoDB, which is a NoSQL style document database uh, that theoretically lets us go up to millions, billions of rows per table, although it does have a hard limit of 16 megabytes per row. This is um, actually problems that we've come across, is that we found researchers often don't understand the best way to store the data that they've got. So they might say, oh, well, everything needs to be on its own row, when actually it's not the case, or there's a more sensible way of organizing the data. But MongoDB itself um, is used for some fairly intensive websites. It's used for um, Craigslist, uh, Foursquare, various other services that deal with lots of small pieces of data. And it can scale up to hundreds of servers fairly easily. But that's only possible by ripping the data out of CSV files, Excel spreadsheets, et cetera, and getting it into a, a natively understood data format. <coughs> Time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you use MongoDB in the back end. Uh, did you run into any issues with uh, keeping your documents uh, sane? Did you have problems with developers just changing your schema without telling another guy and then it would cause problems? Uh, we've, we've not, but that certainly is something that can happen fairly easily. Um, the way that we got around that was, as I mentioned in the slides, by using our own API documentation and forcing ourselves to look at the documentation when we were building things. Um, we built quite a few sets of abstraction functions that actually handle the mechanics of getting data in and out. And we're not storing the entire repository in MongoDB. All of the functional information that surrounds the data itself is stored in a MySQL database, which means that the underlying data we can mostly leave up to however the researcher wants to describe it. So we have a standard object with all our tracking fields in and then a subset of that object basically just contains whatever the, the researcher happened to dump in at the time. We say it's, it's their problem if they suddenly start changing all their schemas. But the benefit of MongoDB is that it can handle that sort of thing, and that we can have two completely disparate documents in a collection with no major problems. Okay, thanks very much. I think we're going to have to Stop the questions at that point. Say thank you again. Good luck. Things that researchers at Lincoln are being uh, better served uh, than, than in, in many other institutions. So congratulations on that. Um, and I'm glad to see that our next presenter has indeed uh, arrived. Uh, Neil Juhai, I guess, are you planning to use your... Uh, you, you should be familiar with the setup here. Neil is uh, based here uh, in Edward, director of the... Software Just Sustainability Institute, uh, who have a parallel set uh, of concerns to those of us at the Digital Curation Centre, worrying about uh, the issues about maintaining software, particularly from uh, research projects, uh, in the the long term. So let's just I need to switch. everyone hear me at the back? Is the microphone working? Excellent. Um, this is good because I feel I've lost a little bit of my voice after the Kaylee yesterday and the second last dance where everyone was going like, yee-haw, and yeah. It's too, too long a night. But uh, thank you very much to the uh, OR um, organizers for putting on that, Kaylee. So as uh, Kevin um, said, uh, my name's Neil Chu Hong. Um, I work for a group called the Software Sustainability Institute. And 
Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about the work where what we're doing, looking at the way that research has developed software, has started overlapping with the concerns of the open repository um, community. And I'll explain a little bit more about this um, as we go along. But really what we're looking at is not the software that's used to implement the infrastructure, but the software that might be deposited within the repository infrastructure. So my background is in uh, helping different researchers uh, work with their software. And over the last uh, 10 or so years, um, I've had the opportunity to work across a whole range of domains. So uh, we've been working with people in uh, the sort of medical area, looking at the way that uh, different diseases are transferred um, by different gen genetic markers, looking at things like the way that the temperature uh, across uh, the sort of ocean temperature affects the uh, overall global warming, and looking at things now increasingly in the social sciences for things like population migration, um, and in the arts and humanities, looking at the uh, digital humanities. So, for instance, understanding the way in which different relationships of people mentioned in serials and texts interrelate with each other across a wider um, corpus. So all of this has led me to believe that there isn't any subject uh, for which software doesn't play an important part in the undertaking of research. So software is pervasive throughout all elements of research now. Uh, and so as a result of that, one of the things that we did, um, uh, myself and colleagues in uh, Manchester, Oxford, and Southampton, was to set up something called the Software Sustainability Institute. Uh, and what we do at the Software Sustainability Institute is we do a number of, thing, number of things at the strategic and a tactical level to try and help all of these different research groups which are developing software and using software in pursuit of their research. So some of the things we might do are help out individual groups understand, uh, for instance, the way in which their APIs are structured. Um, uh, at a grander level, we might be looking at what best practices for uh, the use of code repositories. So what we've been doing is trying to come up with a set of best practice coming from the best practice that's already out there in many different communities and republish it to the scientific computing community. So as part of this, one of the things that we've been looking at is what's the role of software in the longer term? So what do we need to understand about software and its use over periods of five years, 10 years, and so on? Uh, and one of the elements that we've been looking at is the difference between preservation versus sustainability. Um, so the way that we choose to split it is looking at perhaps what happens when we uh, look at botany and so on. So we can preserve things. We can have a seed bank where what we're trying to do is store uh, particular instances for use in the future. So what we're trying to do is preserve the actual materials. Or we can look at sustainability, um, which is looking at preserving the practices and the understanding um, of the particular domain. A lot of the work that we do is focused on the sustainability side, so the way in which practices are continued and evolve and migrate. But what I'm going to be talking about Today is more of what we've been doing on the uh, preservation side. So how do we look at the individual artifacts and ensure that they are kept for the longer term? So a few years back, um, we did a study along with Curtis and Cartwright for JISC looking at the uh, understanding the different reasons why people uh, chose to preserve software and the different approaches that they took. Um, and looking across a wide range of different disciplines, we effectively found that there were four separate reasons why people chose to preserve software. One was achieving legal compliance. So here, what we're talking about, for instance, is software related to, for instance, clinical trials. Um, or it may be because you have uh, software that's uh, used to um, simulate and model buildings. So typically, architectural models uh, look to be kept for at least 25 years and normally for the lifetime of the building. Another reason was creating heritage value. So we saw the efforts that were uh, made, for instance, to store the programs that have been used by authors such as Salman Rushdie. So understanding not just what they were using to write 
um, a book like the Satanic Verses, um, but also what other software was on their computer at that time. So what games were they playing? So what was the, what's the, her uh, the sort of the overall value in understanding all of the software that someone was using at some time and understanding their influences? Um, one which we've seen a lot of uh, over the last few days is enabling continued access to data. So if you have a particular program that is used to create or modify or analyze data, uh, you may want to preserve it so that you have an understanding of how that was done in the future um, and be able to look at some of the data that's, uh, that has been produced in the past in the future. <coughs> And the last one, uh, which is where uh, a lot of the funders are interested in, is encouraging software reuse. So can you, uh, can you gain benefit from pre preserving software uh, in terms of having other people reuse it, other people build on it, other people understand and modify it? So as well as that, we looked at the different approaches that people took to preserve software, and again split it into uh, actually seven approaches, but the... Um, the seventh approach that we, we saw was procrastination, um, so I'm not going to talk too much about that one. Um, and, and again, these split very much into the sort of the, the preserving in aspic versus the preserving in, in function. So on the one hand, we might have something like technical preservation where you're trying to keep the original hardware up and running for as long as you can. Um, or emulation, where what you're doing is you are taking, uh, you're using other technology to uh, emulate the hardware and keeping the software environment as, sta uh, as stable as you can. Other approaches, which I won't talk about so much today, um, include things like migrating your code and constantly evolving it, um, doing things where you're actually transitioning from one piece of software to another. So you're not keeping the original software, but you're identifying other, perhaps better supported software, which you can uh, change to that uh, has the same functionality. Or hibernation, where what you're doing is you are looking at a piece of software and understanding how you can um, preserve enough about the metadata and the knowledge so that you can reproduce it in uh, a later date. And if you're interested in that, um, there's a link on the slides that uh, links to the full report there. So that's one thing that we've done recently that's made us start thinking about the role of software in repositories. The other thing that we've been doing, as we've been looking at the overall training aspect for um, computational scientists, is understanding the sorts of skills that they require to become better computational scientists. So this is computational science across the sciences, the humanities, the social sciences, and the life sciences. And there's an initiative um, uh, which is uh, started off in Canada but has now um, spread worldwide called Software Carpentry, which is about teaching scientists the basic skills to make them better programmers and make them better scientists. So it's all about evidence-led programming. Uh, and one of the things that has come out of that is that the use of repositories is a key skill. So how to understand uh, how to use the different types of repositories is incredibly important as a researcher who develops software. And it's kind of shown in, um, apologies for the fuzziness of this, this slide, it's, it's shown in what's been happening in, in recent years. So uh, hands up how many of you uh, are aware of something called ClimateGate? Heard ClimateGate? Yes. Um, we had an interesting story there. One of the groups that we were about to work with um, in doing an architectural review of their uh, climate, um, uh, basically climate policy framework, uh, we were all ready to, to go, and this was about three and a bit years ago, and suddenly they went silent for six months, um, and we didn't know what was happening. And then we saw some articles in The Guardian, and we, we suddenly um, put two and two together and realized that the group that we were about to work with sat right next to the group, um, the CRU, uh, that were involved in the ClimateGate scandal. So with ClimateGate, the interesting thing here is that um, in some sense, this was all about uh, the possibility that there was bias in science. But what it turned out to really be about was the, the fact that uh, a lot of scientific programs are difficult to understand by others uh, and difficult to get hold of, even. Um, and one of the reasons that, that was articulated for this is that whilst uh, there are a lot of uh, scientists and researchers who are programming, many of them are not formally trained, 
hence the need for things like software carpentry. Um, and many don't understand uh, the, the, the sorts of reasons why they need to be able to um, shift slightly away from the normal method of working. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, the, one of the key things is that it's fun creating um, scientific code. It's not really fun maintaining scientific code. It doesn't fit within the exploratory process of most of, uh, most of research. And one of the reasons that we've been looking at this is, uh, is, is understanding why this is the case. So first little point. Everyone is now talking about re-something. So re is the new black. Uh, and people talk about reuse. People talk about review. People talk about reproducibility, rep repeatability, reusability. Um, there's this whole set of different terms, all uh, starting with the, uh, the word re which actually, when you look at it, boil down to a number of different uh, key sets. So you want, to, you want to have enough there, including the software, that you can do something like reviewing. So if you're a peer reviewer, what you want to be able to do is understand enough about the software and the data and the methods that you can uh, have an understanding of the results presented in a paper. You might also want to repeat um, something. So you come along again later, you want to challenge, um, and you want to understand whether or not this still, this still stands up to scrutiny. You might want to reproduce, so take the same methods, perhaps the same data set, but do it in a different way. So again, you want to understand enough about the way that the software was produced and have uh, a, a good enough idea about its design to be able to reproduce the experiment. Or you might want to be able to reuse. So you might be coming from a different field, and you want to understand whether the techniques that were present in a particular piece of software um, are useful for your own. But the most important one is often missed off that, uh, which is reward. So one of the things that we have been uh, really trying to identify is, what is the best way of rewarding people um, for good software contributions? Um, so if your software that you've created as a part of your research or as part of a larger research department team has gone on to be reused by other people, what do you get out of it? Um, currently, very little. Uh, maybe a pat on the bat back, uh, at best, a really glowing uh, blog post from someone else. Um, so the reward mechanisms are still uh, in their infancy here. And that's really where we're starting to head towards um, in terms of the work that we're doing. So as a result, this is what's led us into this, the uh, sort of repository area. What we've been looking at is understanding what are the new ways in which you can reward uh, the good development of software uh, by researchers. And so one of the things that we've been looking at is that traditionally, the only way you can get credit here is by publishing a paper that happens to mention the software developments. And to do this, normally, you need to have had a significant scientific breakthrough um, rather than a significant programming breakthrough. So what we're looking now at is, can you change this around a bit? Can you, can you uh, see uh, software not just being part of the scholarly record, but an important research output in its own right? So a lot of you will probably have this question, because we've, we've had some great talks over this workshop about uh, data and the role of data in repositories and the role in data as part of the scholarly record. So people will ask, isn't software just data? Um, and to a certain extent, it is. It's still bits um, on a disk or on a tape somewhere. Uh, but one of the things that we've been looking at, uh, along with uh, Cameron Nayland's Beyond Impact initiative that ran a few years ago, is what are the differences between software um, and data when we look at its, uh, it, well, its long-term preservation. And there are a few things that, that we highlighted. So one is the boundary. Uh, so here what we have uh, on the right-hand side is uh, workflow. So this is a scientific workflow. Um, I believe it's a scientific workflow looking at a study of, uh, of the fruit fly. I could be wrong. I'm not a, I'm not a life scientist. Um, each of these different boxes uh, represents a different part in the workflow. Each of the uh, kind of orange boxes refers to a little suite of uh, um, programs. 
each of the blue boxes refers to individual smaller programs as well. So one of the issues we have when we look at comparison with, uh, between data and software is that it's quite difficult to see the boundary of what any person might call um, the, the software. So does it include artifacts like the, um, the workflow? Does it include artifacts like the software that runs the workflow, the software that's referenced by the workflow, um, and the dependencies? So each of these different boxes is running in a particular environment which has a number of dependencies. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we have in workflows um, and in projects such as uh, my experiment, which aim to be a repository for workflows, is how do we identify whether a workflow still runs, um, is, is still relevant, and is still uh, replayable. Um, and one of the problems here is, is understanding what's the granularity. So what's the, what's the part you want to reference? What's the sort of minimum ci citable part? So are we looking at uh, things at the functional level? Um, are we looking at things at the algorithm implementation level, at the software which uses and implements an algorithm, or as part of the larger library or s software suite or package that takes together a number of useful similar things um, and bundles them together? So the granularity um, of software makes it hard to understand what is the piece that you deposit in a repository. And then the last thing that we, we looked at was versioning. Um, so obviously for data collections there is um, an ongoing process where data um, may be, uh, you may add to your collection, you may revise your collection, you may uh, choose to supersede a collection and so on. You may choose to associate them. The same thing is true in software, except you tend to have more collaboration, which means that you have more versions. And I think the important thing here is to understand the different reasons why people choose to version. So we, we choose to version because we want to indicate there's been a change. So for our own sanity, we will perhaps save a new version um, so that we understand that something has changed between version to version. Um, we might also choose to do it to allow sharing. So we, are, we might want to uh, send a piece of software off to a collaborator. Um, and we might want to, do, uh, to create a new version because we want to confer special status. So we might be trying to understand, uh, you know, we might, we might want to say, this is the version that people, wants to, people want to use. So it's a stable version. So for each of these three, uh, three reasons, we may choose to uh, attach a version identifier. And the question becomes, um, which version should go in which repositories? So what, what we've ended up looking at from that study is trying to understand the different roles that repositories play for the storage of software. So it's all about backup, sharing, and archiving. And you, these different roles are present in different repositories. Uh, so. Uh, at one end, you have the source code repositories, um, where really what you're looking at is um, the backup role along with the sharing role. You may have other repositories uh, which are used to deposit artifacts to help them be associated with uh, uh, other parts of scholarly record. So there, it's, it really is about the sharing and the understanding of how people can gain access to the different parts. And then you go all the way through to things like institutional repositories, um, particular subject repositories, where we're looking at archiving. And here we're heading more towards the legal compliance end of the, uh, sort of the, the benefit spectrum. So you have all of these different roles and all these dif different repositories. And the issue really here is about how you can shift software between these different repositories as the role in which uh, for, uh, the reasons why you're trying to preserve it change. So, we have different time scales. Um, we may have different policies, so understanding the licensing requirements. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is understand how we do seamless ingest. So can, can we uh, go, if we have a publicly available repository, uh, are we able to then ingest a copy um, of the software into our institutional repository in the same way that we could ingest uh, a paper that's available in an open access repository? So I'm going to go through a few, uh, just a few slides to finish up with to look at some of the particular issues um, 
that, that might be present when we start uh, doing these kind of processes. Um, so in particular, one of the things that we've been looking at is something called a software meta paper. So this pr the problem that I've described is quite a large one. So we were looking to constrain the problem. And one way we can constrain the problem is, what about if we look only at pieces of software which are associated as part of a single scholarly record? So uh, where we want to preserve the instance of the software that was used to generate uh, a uh, particular research paper. So we're wanting to store the paper, the method, the data sets, and the software. This means that a number of things collapse together. We no longer have so, mu uh, so much a problem about identifying things like the version and the authors, because they are the version and the author that is uh, used within the paper. Um, again, the granularity becomes a slightly easier, because we can refer to the suite of software that was used within the, the the paper, and then the only real issue we have is how do we describe this? So what is the metadata that's required to uh, define this set of software? So the approach that we've been looking at is uh, building on the work of people like Brian Matthews, uh, who, were who was looking at the significant properties of software, is can you capture a minimum amount of this metadata to allow people to understand the software, to so reproducibility more than repeatability, um, in an easily digestible, easily citable form. Um, and so if you are interested in this, uh, we launched something called the Journal of Open Research Software, which allows submissions of software meta papers, which really are a description of what a piece of software does and the operating environment in which that version um, runs in. And this leads us really to where the overlap has happened. So as part of this, we realized that what we were looking for were something uh, acceptable repositories. So places where we could deposit versions of software um, that could be preserved for a long term. Um, and we had a workshop earlier on this week uh, with a number of people chipping in to gain an idea of what an acceptable repository might, uh, might entail. And it's things like understanding uh, whether they have clear access, deposit, and preservation policies, um, the adherence to standards, uh, in particular because uh, we know that if a hosting organization or repository does find itself difficult to, to continue operation, we want to be able to transfer the, um, the software that's deposited in that repository to another repository. And the ability to be able to monitor this, so both the integrity of the software that's stored in the repository, but possibly also um, the obsolescence. So are we able to use the inbuilt um, sort of maintenance checks within digital repositories to also run checks to understand when software becomes obsolete? And the sorts of things that we might be storing in these repositories may be binary files, um, they may be source code, um, or, and this is something that, that particular in particularly in Australia they're beginning to do, understand whether we should just store virtual machine images. So have everything in a virtual machine and store that virtual machine in a repository. And obviously, that poses a number of challenges. One significant challenge we've had as we've started working with uh, institutional repository providers is the potential for confusion. Um, so a lot of the institutional repository providers do accept some form of data deposit. So we look to see. Um, how much needed to be changed to start depositing software. And from a technical perspective, there isn't very much. From a practical perspective, one of the things that was raised in our interviews was, uh, won't this be confusing for the users? So we have this idea of having the right license for the right uh, parts of the scholarly record. Um, CC BY is not the right license for software. Um, and the right license is one of the OSI approved licenses. And there are a lot of them there. And one of the concerns that was raised is that uh, if, you, if you have this as part of your ingest process, your deposit process, will there be confusion between people who were just there at the repository to, um, to deposit publications or data? So the last thing before uh, I wrap up is the other thing that we've looked at is understanding whether or not we need to go a little bit further in terms of uh, giving people an on-ramp for doing this. 
And one of the one of the things, obviously, that's been very uh, big in the journals and uh, open access world is understanding what are the different levels that make something more accessible um, and more useful. And one question I will pose as a sort of final um, comment is: Do we need something for software where we're talking about the five stars of accessible software or available software? where we're going all the way from knowing that a piece of software exists, which is often very important and represents a slight um, difference from the, the open access community in that I think the basic level, so this is my personal opinion, is that you must be able to know that a piece of software exists, so it's the metadata that's open, all the way through to the software being available under open licenses um, and being referenced such that we understand the context in which a piece of software is being used. So that was really a, a very kind of swift journey at a very high level through the sorts of work that we've been doing um, at the SSI. And I think I just want to leave you with three points. Um, the first one is, is to recognize that researchers are developing more software than ever before. And they are trying to do it in a better way. So there has been a big change in the last few years in the way that people develop software within science, sparked by things like ClimateGate. They want to be rewarded for um, creating a complete scholarly record. This includes software. So we need to have an understanding of how to make the infrastructure, uh, uh, how we understand from the infrastructure the impact that a piece of software has had. And that might include things like being able to cite software. And uh, actually, I think some of you out there probably know the answer to this, but I don't, so please tell me. Um, we still don't know the best way to shift um, from one repository role to another. So as we go through the use of repositories for uh, backup, through to sharing, through to archival, we don't quite understand the, uh, the sort of like little um, pieces that need to be done to go between each of these roles and each of these repositories for software. So um, thank you very much. Just a couple of minutes, I think, for, for questions on, on Neil's talk. Do we? Yep. Yeah. One over there again for that. Thanks, Neil. That was a great talk. Um, I know with licensing, with software and with data, it's different at the moment based on the licenses. But I can see, because we don't have that consistency, there could be problems down the future. The data is under a particular license for reuse, and the software is under another one. Um, can you comment on that? Um, yes, yeah, so on the slide, which I skipped past very quickly as I realized I was starting to run out of time, uh, there's a link to particularly some work that's been done by Victoria Stodden on um, the sort of correct licenses for different parts of the scholarly record. And I think uh, one, of the, one of the things that's clear is that if we're looking at the reward mechanisms, um, people want to be... Uh, associ you know, associated with the work they produce. So effectively what we're looking at is what uh, OSI approved licenses are, com are compatible in spirit with the CC BY, um, Creative Commons license for data. And essentially there are those licenses. They're, they're the equivalent of the BSD or the Apache licenses. So I think what we need to do is I put a large list of OSI approved licenses there. Effectively what we need to be doing is changing that and persuading people to use the ones which are um, in spirit the same as CC BY, or um, CC0, which is equivalent to public domain in the software world. Time for one. One more question. Okay, I'll just leave this down with the thought of why is it that a paper which happens to reference a piece of software has more value than a program which happens to reference a paper. Uh, each of those, I think, would, should have equal value. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you. Thank you.
Todd Grappone and uh, Sharon Fogg, both of whom are associate university librarians uh, at, at UCLA. One uh, responsible for digital initiatives in, in teaching, is that right? And Sharon uh, for collections and scholarly communication. And kind of, you, you do seem to have sorted yourself out here. I know they're going to be doing a, a two handed presentation here. Are you just swapping the once or are you doing a sort of tag team? Do you want to get them? Okay, yeah, in that case, we'll need the, the handheld mic down here rather than trying to, if one of you wears the mic and the other uses the handheld. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thank you. So, um, uh, we're here today to talk about um, this uh, archive that we've built at UCLA. Uh, the archive has been uh, actually being uh, developed since uh, the Watergate hearing. It's uh, um, an archive of broadcast news. Um, in its earliest instance, it was a series of videotape recordings off uh, broadcast television, but for the past seven years, it's been um, uh, a digital iteration. So these are, uh, again, uh, broadcast television news sources um, brought into a, a digital library. Uh, and what we're doing now is we're taking that content and we're producing an uh, interface that's um, uh, searchable, browsable in many different ways in order to make this content available to the uh, UCLA community initially, uh, then the University of California system, and then we hope to make it broadly available to the rest of the academic world uh, sometime later next year. Our presentation today is going <coughs> to uh, touch on a couple of different things. Um, uh, Sharon uh, has been taking the lead on the legal issues with regard to uh, uh, us broadcasting or rebroadcasting, there's that reword again, um, this, uh, this information. Um, which on one hand could be uh, considered uh, entertainment, on the other hand it is very much academic content uh, and is being used as <coughs> academic content. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about how we built the archive, what the architecture looks like. Um, the presentation um, is really uh, PowerPoint driven, it's slide driven. Uh, the real power of the archive comes in when you can actually uh, see some of the scholarly output of it. There's uh, a couple of our faculty members who have done um, what I'm calling Rashomon style uh, storytelling from uh, the content of this archive. And if you're interested in some of that, um, uh, come see me afterward and I can do a, uh, a demo for you of some of that stuff. It's really, really good. Um, just one more thing about uh, uh, the archive. It's been being developed at UCLA for quite a while. And uh, maybe five to seven years ago, the, um, uh, the faculty member who was interested in developing this archive and had begun uh, capturing the digital broadcast came to the library and asked, um, would we be interested in uh, sharing this content? At the time, um, there was a lot of uh, apprehension from the library in engaging in this kind of project due to the fact that uh, the archive grows at about a terabyte a month. Um, uh, there's a real sustainability question. Um, the technology was um, a little bit uh, outside of the uh, core scope of the IT department that the, the library currently had. And I think we had a, a number of questions about uh, the legality of doing what, what we're doing. Um, two years ago, uh, Sharon and I teamed up, and we were able to see beyond some of those uh, basic questions. and really bring the archive uh, up and online very rapidly after we figured out it was something we wanted to do about a year ago. Um, and it took both of us working very hard on different aspects of uh, the archive to um, bring it online. So um, uh, I've put the presentation up on SlideShare. Uh, I tweeted it out earlier, so if you guys want to download it and follow along, uh, we have a bunch of slides in there. Oh, right. It is me. Okay. Um, so this is uh, kind of a mess, this slide, um, but so is the archive. I mean, it's, it, it is and it isn't. Um, and what the archive is, is uh, you know, it's these data points. So we've got 
150,000 television news broadcasts, and that grows every day. We digitize about 100 channels right now. You can do programming level, program level metadata search, so that that includes almost a billion words of closed caption. We do OCR on text on the screen. As you'll see later on, we do some facial recognition on people within the news broadcast to make it just a really rich and compelling interpretation of this news. And as a result, we've got just a giant, giant image archive, text archive, with some metadata around it to allow for an archive, I think, that is of interest to scholars of all stripes, from public health to historians to communication studies. The reason we were interested in doing this particular archive at this particular time is that as people who work in the library, we felt that the way libraries have been collecting news over the past decade or so has really changed. We don't, it's harder and harder to collect newspapers, right? So there's less and less of them. So one of the things we were trying to do as an outcome of this product was figure out new ways for us as a library to collect the news. And I think that's all I wanted to say here. Okay, good morning. So Todd said a little about what the archive is. I'm gonna say a little, and as you mentioned, I'm kind of the policy side of our duo. So I wanna say a little bit about why it's important. And for us, it really starts with mission. The slide behind me is the University of California's copyright policy. And a couple of things about that that I think are really important to highlight. Three in particular. One, it emphasizes and uses the two words, public good. Two, it talks about free expression. And third, it talks about the exchange of ideas, all of which is really important, critical to teaching and learning and our mission. It's also, I think, the case we're gonna make that this television news archive at UCLA is a really good example of mission fulfillment. A quick note that probably isn't news to anyone in this room, in some ways in contrast to the mission of the University of California, and as it was mentioned at the drinks reception, the University of Edinburgh here, probably many of our colleagues from other institutions across the world, is that in Los Angeles, we reside also in the home of the MPAA, which is the Motion Picture Association of America, and the RIAA, and they actually have quite a different idea. And so in some ways, this is a bit of contested turf here, or at least potentially contested turf as we see it. Just one more note on kind of the broader mission set issues. I think this is a really nice expression of the higher education mission that Pelican has. We often think of it as the shorthand of teaching research, and in our case, public service. But I really like that it also, here he mentions scholarly publication and diffusion of knowledge, and that is definitely one of the things that I think you'll see as we go through what this broadcast news archive can afford. So now for the good bits. I'm gonna go through basically how we go about capturing our content and what the system looks like. And this is it in its entirety, but we're gonna walk right through it. As I mentioned before, we currently capture about 100 news stations. A lot of that is US news, but we also capture, we've got a couple of international collaborators who capture Danish news, Czech Republic, Russia, Moscow, 
uh, some other folks. Um, since we started this a few years ago, it's actually become quite, quite easy to uh, grab this content. Um, it's become, you know, harder to you know, keep an archive that we can sustain. Um, so uh, we, c we pull all the broadcast plus the, the closed caption streams. Um, we use a scheduler. It's pretty simple stuff. We can go in there and tell it, you know, uh, what time, what show, uh, what channel. But we can also go in there and, and um, do uh, news events that aren't scheduled. That happens once in a while. Um, and we have a capture and encoding system that runs some analysis scripts. Our uh, uh, video is encoded to uh, some lowest latency storage. This is the format we pull it in, so it's the digital format. Uh, we compress it to H.264. Um, so we compress it pretty, uh, pretty deeply. Um, it's still uh, uh, quite usable for uh, uh, our scholars. We find that the actual video itself is not as popular as some of the metadata content that surrounds it. Um, a lot of our, our researchers are, are interested in um, uh, textual, textual analysis, um, analysis of the uh, um, uh, still images we capture, some other things like that. Um, but it's still pretty, pretty low. Uh, we pile everything into, um, uh, we had been working on um, uh, just some homegrown disk storage, but it uh, became, uh, it's just started to uh, really smoke after we had about 10 users on it, so we had to move up to some uh, fairly decent hardware. Uh, we're now using some Isilon storage. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we do a lot of processing of the stream, so we capture an image uh, from the video stream every 10 seconds. Uh, we use that for visual navigation. Um, so metadata is automatically captured through the closed caption streams. Um, and information based on um, what comes out of the broadcast. Uh, that's kind of what our um, uh, metadata snapshot looks like. Uh, Timestamp, show, um, every, every broadcast has a unique ID, uh, and we talk about the duration. Um, our, uh, our metadata stream also um, is uh, cut by um, Second to second as to being as what to what's being said on screen, right? So you can do full search of uh, closed captioning, um, and we use a software called um, uh, Solar Lucene. It's part of the Apache Software Foundation uh, to do. Uh, we back everything up. That's that part of the screen slide. Um, so we also provide a user interface. Our user interface is really based on search only. Um, we have just that kind of access. Um, as I said before, we've, we've had some uh, faculty members developing different kind of content using different tools, um, but they really use the um, metadata. We provide just the search and browse interface. Um, the web server goes back and makes a call. This is kind of what the, um, uh, this is really what the search interface looks like. Keyword. Uh, you can search time and date. All these networks. This is not a comprehensive list. Um, you can sort by uh, different fields and factors based on um, your search criteria um, in uh, different display formats and um, all the series we capture. <coughs> some of which we currently capture. Some of which we don't. The archive itself right now sits at about uh, 40 terabytes and it grows at about one a month as I say. Um, right now it's, uh, the archive is limited to on campus at UCLA. Um, our uh, goal is to this, um, by the end of this calendar year, uh, provide access to the archive to the full University of California system. Our streaming server. We provide video feedback to authorized users. This is what the, uh, the search results stream looks like. Um, uh, so uh, <coughs> your search term shows up bold. Um, we can provide you uh, video based on um, where your ter search term came back. Uh, you can click on text view, view the entire transcript. Um, this montage button uh, is really the uh, image
image browse. So you click on that and you'll get um, one of those 10 second video images and so it's based on what based on where your keywords show up. Um, and you can do a metada metadata browse. So um, the metadata browse allows you to get a, a permanent link to that portion in the video where your uh, keyword was mentioned. Um, okay, so um, so let me just first make a comment that as we go through a little bit of the next couple of slides, um, our, our orientation and our legal orientation um, is U.S.-centric, so, so that said, that's what it is. Um, but it is really important, and every time we talk about this, one of the first questions we get asked is, well, what do you mean by news? So, um, and I do think as we continue to work through how we're going to make this um, archive and all of its functionality uh, more broadly available, um, we are going to return to this question. So here's the Oxford English uh, Dictionary Online's definition. A couple things I think about it just to note is it's really broad, you know? It's about current, it's about recent, it's about information, it's about things that are the subject of what folks are talking about. Um, notice nowhere in this does it just say it's about what's on national networks, doesn't specify anything like that. Um, um, I want to just kind of show and tell a little bit about what um, there is um, a very preeminent news archive in the United States. It was started at Vanderbilt University. Click me again. Um, the content that they uh, began with and they, that they, they continue to collect are the three U.S. major network news stations. Here they are, ABC, CBS, NBC. They added CNN. Um, in contrast to that, keep on clicking, um, there is a wide array of uh, sources out there. And at UCLA, we are interested in all of them. We are, def we are definitely interested in international. We're also very interested in local, um, because in some cases, local is the least likely to be preserved. Um, so here's just an array. And again, like one of the first questions, so you'll see this Comedy Central icon. Um, one of the questions we got asked a lot early on by the lawyers, and we're going <laughs> to talk to them about it, our campus lawyers is, um, what are you doing, you know, capturing uh, Comedy Central? And what about Comedy Central? But Comedy Central, as many of you may know, has Jon Stewart, who every evening has newsmakers on. And we consider that to be part of the news and the record. And so we are going to continue to capture it and make it available. Um, here is the Vanderbilt News Archive website homepage behind me. And again, this is just uh, the four uh, sources that they collect. Uh, they began um, right after, uh, right at actually, the Republican convention in the States in 1968. The guy who started it, Paul Simpson, was initially really interested in bias in the news. He was from the state of Tennessee. The news was being broadcast out of New York. He went to visit these network stations, but what he found to his complete surprise and shock was that um, they were re-recording over the news broadcast within a week, and so in part his real focus was on the need to preserve the news. Um, at Vanderbilt, they don't stream. They are using Section 108F3, which is in some ways referred to as the Vanderbilt exception. There's a big, long story about that we don't have time for. They will, if you make a request, send you a DVD. They're on a cost recovery basis. Um, they do no interpretation. No context is uh, provided. The user needs to know what they need to know to request the DVDs they're going to get. Um, 
In 2005, the Library of Congress charged a study group made up of industry, many, um, a number of publishers, some librarians and archivists, some funders. They came out with a specific recommendation regarding this particular section of 108, which was more forward thinking. It did allow for streaming, view only copies for private study, scholarship, and research. So even though this is not legislation, this is the direction and certainly where we want to move. Um, in the United States, there is fair use. In Israel, there's fair use. Um, and in other places, there's versions of things that come close as you have fair dealing. Um, the two things that are important, four factors on the left side, but in particular for us, transformativeness. And we think that these two questions about transformativeness make it possible for us to make this broadly available. Um, in particular, there's some features of the news archive. Todd pointed to a number of them. Please see us for the demo. We can, it's much easier to see that. But um, this is not, uh, at UCLA, it is not just slavish copies of the news that we're interested in presenting. There's a lot more going on. Um, this picture that has Obama and some other faces uh, shows that we have facial recognition capability. There are these metadata updates. There's a lot of tool development, both that exists right now and that will come in addition in the future. Here's an example from a piece of research a couple of different folks at UCLA did. These are brain scans. These were students that were part of a study that looked at um, effective learning. The ones on the top that have um, what the researchers were referring to as Christmas trees, more like Christmas trees were showing active engagement. That meant they were using all these parts of their brains the um, image part and the text and everything about the news archive um, is part of what made that possible. And on the bottom is the ones who did not, were not as uh, successful in the learning objectives. Obviously, we are um, very much taking the moral high ground. Um, we began, and in some ways I began, uh, with the mission of higher ed in conclusion as to the library mission. Um, again, you know, the, the news archive uh, is a dynamic example of um, mission fulfillment. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. One final thought. Um, uh, so this, as I said before, I think there's a, a strong library mission to, to, in here to um, create uh, news archives. Um, and we felt that there was a, a, uh, a hole in our collection when it came to this uh, type of service. But I think it really took um, a faculty member who uh, has taken uh, this content and helped us transform it in a way that really made it, uh, I think, incredibly easy for us to see the transformative nature of the service uh, in a way that we could use um, the fair use clause to, to publicize it. Um, and it's uh, just the final thought I'd leave you with is if you haven't done um, patron driven digital library exactly. development, um, you should because it's uh, uh, very fulfilling and it leads to uh, wonderful archives and wonderful projects. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, guys, and thanks for finishing on time. Yeah. Enough time to give us. Uh, time for a few questions here, and I'll just get the microphone back. Mic for our. Uh, yeah. So I see one over here from Joss. That was very interesting, and I'm, I'm glad I made it when swapping sessions from one thing to another. Um, uh, I'd just like to point out a couple of things. In, uh, we're hosting something called Just Media Hub, which you might have come across, and inside that is work which the BUFEC did uh, with uh, ITN and Reuters and their news clips. And so very much the, the 20th century is like this digitally recorded world which we've got. A uh, big challenge we have when we're trying to make a usable service out of that, to both search and find, and then also how you make use of it for that, is a, an incredible sparseness of useful metadata. The contextual metadata is just not there. And so the, it's a question, I think, of the real challenges of how you, you mentioned search and browse. Well, there's, there's not a lot to browse on. 
And search is pretty useless in a sense because people come up with terms which are not represented in your metadata stack. And so we've been trying to explore ways of explore by either collection or by place or by other ways or by popular and all the rest of the stuff. And I think it's really challenging. One of the, th the ideas that we have had, and I think you made mention of some of this implicitly, but maybe you've been doing a lot more, is a way of, if you like, triangulating across to the textual news reportage. So going to, to the news, um, say in the Times, high, you know, or whatever it is, we're using the coordinates of time, space, and, 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 and topic to find the reportage on the very same thing, which gives you the possibility of augmenting the metadata and making your resources more findable, as well as providing context. So um, uh, what I'd say is, uh, if you stop and see, see me afterwards, I'll show you the demo I, I was hoping to do here. It, it really needs a VPN service and Google Earth to set up. <laughs> But what it is, is it's uh, a curation of um, the archive uh, based on uh, a few events in Los Angeles history. And what it does is it, it takes uh, the broadcast news, it mixes that content up with uh, on the street video from people who were at the event, uh, CCTV, LAPD content, uh, Twitter, and uh, courtroom transcripts. And so it's it, it does this sort of thing you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, we've so far only worked with a couple of faculty members to, to, to do this sort of uh, um, uh, publishing from, from the archive. And um, we feel like that is really our next step, is to do more and more, uh, you know, create a visual search engine, do something that um, these type of uh, primary sources will force us to do uh, that we really haven't done before. So. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we've, we're really excited about it, and um, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of the next uh, uh, frontier for, for us as well. Okay, I think we've got this question down here from Bill Hunter. I'll give you some more over there. In terms of the uh, technical development of, of the archive, uh, to what extent <coughs> does the UC, UC University of California uh, archive reflect the general trends of development in in the moving image domain. I, I used to work in this area, and, and there's the Association of Moving Image Archivists. I know are, are very active in, in developing uh, uh, systems for uh, and sharing information around the development of such systems. How is yours reflective of the general trend in moving image archives in terms of their technical development? Is uh, Are you sharing technologies and, and methods and techniques um, to develop these types of archives? Um, so we've, um, uh, uh, we have a digital preservation person <coughs> on our staff who's doing just that. Um, honestly, I think we, we need to do more. Um, but the truth is, is this archive that I'll show you after this meeting um, hasn't really been brought online yet. It's, you know, it's just for UCLA right now. Um, this is our first uh, foray into talking about it. Um, we feel like uh, the, the work we've done has been really standards driven so far, um, but having uh, further and deeper discussions with the community is exactly what we hope to accomplish over the next, uh, next six months. So we, we feel like our, you know, we're pretty standards driven, but um, we need to circle back. And though we have a digital preservation person who's been doing that for us. Yeah, she's a video specialist as well. I guess I should have mentioned that. Um, that we're okay, but we just need to make that connection happen.
uh, that I'm going to talk to us about now and indeed how it, how it fits in with, with what they're doing. So John and Claire. How's, are you hearing me in the back? The sun? Okay. As Kevin said, I'm Claire. This is John. We're only going to switch off once, though, so not as much, not as much dancing. I'm going to talk very briefly, uh, just give you a little bit of background and history, talk about the motivations for the Variations on Video project, and then John is going to actually take us through some of the architecture, technical decisions, roadmap, and actually have a demo, if I keep to my time limit. Um, sorry. So the, this project has actually been underway since we got our first grant from IMLS, a uh, planning grant that started back in August 2010. But the project has very deep roots, um, dating back to Indiana University started developing a product called Variations back in 1996, which was a, um, originally designed as a digital music management uh, and delivery system. Uh, which is now in use at 20 different institutions um, and uh, has been gone through, I think, three versions at this point. So uh, a lot of very deep experience in Indiana, in particular with this type of development. The Variations on Video project, however, is a fresh start, a new partnership with Northwestern, so we're starting over from the ground up. And the, the basic goal of the project is to develop uh, an open source system that is really tailored to the specific needs of libraries and archives. Um, and it's very important for us to be de very deeply integrated <coughs> with the broader community on this in a number of ways. First of all, everything that we're developing for the, through the project we're going to be releasing is open source. As much as possible, we're trying to work with leverage um, existing technologies and we are uh, really trying to engage deeply with a very broad community of potential users and developers. And that actually started from the beginning of our uh, planning project phase. So these are our current partners. Um, they have all committed to continuing to participate as testers, piloters, and contributors. Right now, the development is happening between at Indiana and at Northwestern although that may uh, expand as we get into some of the later phases of the project. Um, so I mentioned that Indiana has a deep experience in this area. They've been doing a lot with media delivery and audio for, uh, course, for courses. We don't really have time to talk about this today, but maybe in the Q&A, John could elaborate on the really impressive media preservation initiative that's going on at Indiana. If you haven't read their um, report that came out just a few months ago, I highly recommend it. A very ambitious project to both characterize and then to attempt to begin preserving the uh, uh, moving time-based media assets across the entire university. At Northwestern, we've also been doing a lot in this area. We've been providing um, streaming audio and video for courses since 2001, so we're well up Last time we counted, which was actually a couple of years ago, we were well above 50,000 um, time-based media assets. Nothing like nine million images, but you know we're getting, <laughs> getting up there. Uh, we also have an audiovisual preservation specialist on our staff now who is beginning the process of treating some of our archival collections. And those are two of the most important use cases for this project, the uh, course-based delivery and um, working with archival collections. We're also seeing a lot of change right now in libraries with acquisitions of licensed video collections. A lot of this is for teaching, and there's a lot of variation in those offerings. Some of them are um, d delivered remotely. Some are actually purchased with perpetual use rights and have to be managed locally. So there are a lot of different needs that are kind of specific to this uh, research and teaching support mission of libraries. Um, our existing repository systems, as wonderful as they are, are not really designed to handle this kind of media very well. We really need to be able to integrate with specialized servers for streaming, obviously, um, but also for transcoding. There's still a certain amount of volatility with file formats, so um, we know we need to have the ability to automate um, creation of derivatives down, down further on down the road. We need specialized players. We need to support creation of clips and playlists and all kinds of interactivity at the user end. Um, and we really do have, with uh, this time-based media, a lot of the same issues we have with research data. The files are very large. 
um, which may, means uh, HTTP upload has, uh, we think, probably a very limited use uh, for managing content like this. And they're also quite complex um, in their intellectual structure, uh, you know, the content itself. If you think about even something as familiar as an audio recording, which might have multiple physical CDs, you might have multiple works on a recording, each work might have multiple subparts. So we know that our tools for creating and handling metadata, um, to say nothing of the schema themselves, are going to have to be pretty sophisticated. And I think the one area where we've, we had, we found that the existing solutions really <coughs> fell short uh, most significantly was on access control. Particularly, um, as Sharon talked about, you know, when we're working with copyrighted material or in the case of libraries and archives, we may have content that has cultural sensitivity issues. We really need to have quite sophisticated access control um, capabilities in the system. Um, I'm not going to go through these in any detail, but these are just a few of the things that we looked at as we were developing um, and scoping the project. So these are, it, some of these actually we will be incorporating <coughs> into the project. Others we know that we have to be able to integrate with. We have some partners who are using Kaltura. It's a very popular one. So, um, but we, we didn't find in any of these that really the, the complete solution that we felt we needed for our institutions and that libraries and archives need. Oops, there was one at the end there, sorry. All right, I'll turn it over to John. <coughs> All right, so Claire's uh, given you uh, an introduction to the project and uh, talked about uh, some of the motivations behind uh, what we're doing. I just wanted to uh, now talk a bit about the kind of functionality we envision more specifically for what we're developing, talk a bit about the technical architecture, and uh, hopefully have time to uh, show some of it to you. Um, so this is a, these are some of the basic functions that, that we hope to support with what we're developing or plan to support, you know, the ability um, to obviously to ingest uh, video content, as Claire mentioned, to transcode that to appropriate formats for access and retranscode to uh, new formats as they evolve. Um, the ability to uh, create descriptive metadata uh, for discovery, uh, both through direct entry and cataloging of, of content, as well as uh, being able to import metadata from a variety of, diff variety of different sources, because we're talking about needs to deliver both published and unpublished content, content from libraries, archives, diverse, you know, set of collections and, and uh, you know, certainly in our case at Indiana, a diverse set of different kinds of units who have managed collections of, of video and audio across the institution. We need to be able to bring in thing, everything from MARC to EAD to um, local uh, databases to uh, uh, Excel spreadsheets uh, to, um, you know, to various other formats. Uh, we want to provide uh, some basic discovery uh, uh, browsing and searching capabilities uh, as well as eventually some more advanced capabilities in that area. Obviously we need to be able to deliver video and audio uh, and then as Claire said enable users to navigate through that in an intelligent way rather than just you know say get uh, five hours of, of some archival video collection field collection and have no way to really f get to the part that, that one is actually interested in, in, in working with and provide the ability to reuse that content uh, in, in all sorts of different contexts uh, uh, to support research, teaching, and learning. Uh, so I'm not going to go through this in, in a huge amount of detail, but this uh, shows some of the basic architectural components. Uh, the components in, um, in uh, blue and, and the arrows in blue are things that we will have later in the project. The, the, the black pieces are pieces we at least have the beginnings of now. Uh, you can see that we are basing this uh, on uh, a number of existing technologies, uh, including in particular Fedora, uh, Solar, Hydra, uh, the OpenCast Matterhorn um, uh, system, which is a system originally designed for uh, classroom video capture and delivery, but which we're reusing par parts of it to support our uh, video processing needs. I'll talk a bit more about that in the next slide. Um, you know, we plan to, we will have uh, interfaces both for uh, collection managers uh, to ingest content, users to access content, uh, need to integrate with a vari wide variety of other systems, as you can see, to make this an effective solution uh, within an institutional context. Uh, we also need to be able to integrate with uh, potentially a wide variety of different video delivery 
uh, platforms that institutions may have uh, in terms of streaming server technology or other media delivery servers. Uh, uh, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of complex integrations involved. Um, I, probably many of you are at least somewhat familiar with the Hydra framework, which is a Ruby on Rails-based uh, framework um, to develop applications around Fedora at this point, so we're, we're leveraging that. Opencast Matterhorn, I mentioned, um, uh, has a video processing or media processing pipeline uh, workflow engine that we're using to manage the transcoding, which is then done uh, via FFmpeg, but we can potentially integrate other video uh, and audio processing steps along the way, including some of the things that uh, uh, the UCLA folks discussed, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, closed caption data extraction and uh, um, uh, text uh, recognition and that kind of thing we hope to add. Uh, that would be useful for some sorts of content down the road. Uh, so we need to be able to, to deliver to the various kinds of devices and browsers that people have. Uh, you may be aware that there are a number of different technologies that are required to do that at this point. There's not a single uh, kind of delivery method and uh, uh, codec uh, that, that works across all devices. So we need to be able to, to support a wide variety of different delivery methods and, and delivery platforms. I um, wanted to say a little bit about the content modeling uh, work that we have been doing. Uh, we plan to use uh, metadata, descriptive metadata standard called, well, metadata standard called PB Core to support um, descriptive metadata as well as uh, some aspects of our uh, technical and structural metadata. In terms of the Fedora content model, um, we're developing a model which is, is very atomic in that uh, there are separate object Fedora objects for the <coughs> kind of intellectual, intellectual concept of a, um, a, a piece of media uh, and then uh, the various uh, files that make that up. Uh, we're continuing to investigate exactly how we're going to handle structural metadata both um, to support navigation and to kind of define how these the various files that make up a, a, a video or audio object fit together. Um, we're also looking uh, further at how this would integrate with, um, we're focused really on access in the system, but we want to be able to integrate with um, preservation repositories and preservation repository capabilities as well. As well. So, uh, for example, we're working very closely with uh, WGBH, which has an NEH grant uh, to um, start building a Fedora-based um, uh, video preser preservation repository. Uh, we're also interest in, interested in being able to support uh, annotation uh, including uh, interoperability with the uh, OAC, the Open uh, Annotation Collaboration uh, Project, which has developed some spec specifications for annotation of various media formats. So uh, we have just finished our first kind of internal release of the software. We've really been in active development um, only for the past, the uh, project's been going on for a little while now, but only been in active development for the past three or four months, really. Uh, and so we, we've uh, developed our first internal release, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, that it was basically about kind of getting the pieces to work together and, and demonstrating that, that the architecture that we uh, have designed uh, is actually going to work for us. Uh, at, but then later this year, in December, we hope to have the first release that will actually have, you know, be encouraging people to, to download and try to install locally, and we'll have documentation around that and so forth. And that will add uh, these additional uh, features, including starting to work on the important uh, issues of authentication and authorization, which, as Claire said, are important uh, for a great deal of the content uh, we're, we're dealing with. And then the grant-funded portion of the project goes uh, through 2014. And from there, we hope to be able to, to, to um, continue uh, this work at Indiana Northwestern, but also leveraging involvement from other uh, members of the community who, who share these sorts of needs and are interested in uh, contributing towards them. So with that, let me uh, quickly jump to the demo. So the kind of two pieces of this. Uh, first, I will show uh, a, a screen recording of the ingest process. If I can jump to the right point here. So. Uh, this is, uh, this is Hydrant, which is the code name uh, for our first uh, Hydra-based release. OK, 
Okay, here we go. Okay, so the uh, user has logged in here uh, and uh, clicks on Add New Item. Uh, finds a lo file locally to upload. Uh, and this is HTTP upload, so obviously it's going to be a fairly small file. Um, for larger files, we'll have to have other ingest methods. Um, so you can see uh, files uploading. You can see the conversion status on the left, uh, showing that the no files have been loaded yet. So the file's been uploaded, it's there. Uh, you can see on the left, uh, the status is it's preparing the file for conversion. Uh, it's detected that it is video. I think in this case, it's a QuickTime uh, movie file containing H.264 video. Uh, as I said before, this, this first release, we're just kind of hooking the basic pieces together. So we don't have a very sophisticated metadata editor yet. We just uh, selected about four fields to use uh, initially for the metadata. Obviously, we'll need much more than that. So uh, the user here is, is entering the metadata, title, creator, potentially a summary. This person's a slow typist. So I will jump out of this, and you, so you can imagine what happens next. They enter the metadata. Um, in the background, uh, the OpenCast Matterhorn software is handling the transcoding using FFmpeg uh, to, I think, two, in this case, two different um, flash video-based derivatives that will be put on a Red5 streaming server. That's all happening in the background. Eventually, the conversion status would update to show that that's available, and then I will close the movie here. Oops. And jump to a web browser and show you uh, what this looks like live uh, as a user. And so uh, I could search on Nutcracker, and you see I get a couple of results back. Um, I have fastest at the top. This is using Blacklight, uh, which is part of the Hydra framework for discovery. Um, I could also uh, browse all of the items in the repository, and there aren't very many in our, our test server right now. Um, but I can choose one and uh, play it back. <laughs> And right now, uh, this the player that we're using is Stro yeah, Strobe uh, Media Player, um, which was fairly easy to implement and uh, uh, supports both uh, flash-based streaming and HTML5 uh, mm -hmm. video. Uh, that's not the player we're going to use long-term. In the next release, we're going to move uh, to a player based on the uh, Engage player, uh, also part of the OpenCast Matterhorn project. Uh, and that player has, has uh, some very nice features as far as accessibility uh, and annotation and some nice navigation capabilities that we hope to build on. Oops. Sorry. So, um, we talked about variations on video, variations on video, uh, you know, coming from uh, a pre prior project called Variations. Well, uh, one thing we're actually going to, <laughs> to do here, which is going to be a little bit confusing, is, is that, that we're going to use, be using a different name going forward mm -hmm. uh, to distinguish this from this, the variation system, which does still exist, and as Claire mentioned, is used by a number of institutions, in which you can find at variations.sourceforge.net uh, if you're interested. <laughs> Uh, and so as we start to publicize this more and, and release it, we, we are going to be using the name Avalon uh, for the software, and, and that, that is an acronym for Audio Video Archives and Libraries Online. Uh, and so uh, if you hear variations on video, Avalon, they're the same thing. Uh, just want to talk briefly about our development process. Uh, we have been using a, an agile scrum approach with a single team. Uh, distributed between uh, Indiana University and Northwestern University. I talked a little bit about that in the panel yesterday morning. Uh, we have these other, our other partners who are committed to uh, 
installing testing, providing feedback on the software and on requirements and so forth. Um, our wiki and JIRA mailing lists are all open. You can come in and, and really look at, at what we're doing. Uh, the code is in GitHub, uh, so we're being very kind of open in terms of our development process. We have uh, regular, every two week uh, at the conclusion of our, our uh, development sprints, we have a demo session that's recorded and those are, uh, are linked through the wiki. Uh, and as I said, our hope here is that as we have software um, that people start to use and find interesting, uh, that some of the partners we have or, or new partners potentially will join in and help uh, help us form a community really around this to develop additional features uh, because we really don't think there is another um, uh, solution in the community that is as comprehensive as, as what we're trying to create here. So for more information you can this the URL there goes to our wiki right now uh, with this new name Avalon we're going to have a new website as well which we're going to unveil within the next uh, month or so. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook or feel free to talk to us afterwards or, or join, our, join our email list. We have lots of ways to uh, let you keep up on, on what we're doing and, and get involved in the project. So thank you very much. And John, do we have any any questions for them on, on what they've been talking about this this difficult but uh, increasingly common issue of trying to serve video to the public? Uh, firstly, it looks like a great system. Um, knowing how many researchers want to actually do something with video. Um, are you thinking of putting it in different formats for mobile devices, like for iPad and iPhone? Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, yeah. Delib the ability to deliver content to mobile devices is an important part of our <coughs> requirements. So yes, you know, like the, the, the formats that video gets transcoded in will be configurable so that an institution or organization implementing it can, can choose that. But uh, I think typically, you know, one would choose, uh, want to choose uh, formats that would be deliverable to mobile devices and then the, the player um, piece of it should automatically figure out the appropriate um, uh, version and, and delivery methodology to, to, to get that content to that particular device. We're focusing on iOS and Android uh, based mobile devices. Okay, is there any further further questions at this point? I do have another question, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, we, we actually do um, high definition conferencing in that um, with a number of universities around the world. And so we get a lot of, um, the video is huge. Um, is your system able to cope with like hours of uh, high definition content as well? That's the plan. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I think there are different strategies for how you would sort of ingest that kind of content in the, into the system. And we were just talking about this actually, whether. Um, you know, and this applies to digitized, well, if, you know, if you're digitizing standard def content uncompressed, you have very large files as well, or, you know, HD video that comes from, from uh, say, television production sorts of environments. Uh, so whether you would kind of ingest that original very, very large file directly into the system or first kind of downsample it to, to kind of an intermediate or mezzanine file and then load that in, um, you know, there, there's some different trade-offs there. but. But yes, no, it sh we should be able to handle uh, high def. Yeah, we're doing, um, both, we're at both institutions doing high resolution film scanning as well. I'm actually not sure which is larger in terms of the bit rate, um, but that, you know, we do anticipate needing to deal with very, very large stuff. Thanks. Great. I just had a, a question about how you reference the files internally. Um, I, I saw you uh, uploading a file with a particular file name. Is it stored internally with that file name, or, or do, you, do you store perhaps using a checksum as an identifier? And how do you deal with collisions if somebody uploads something with the same name? Yeah, well, um, I think Fedora PID partly take care of that. Um, everything, we haven't actually talked about identifiers specifically for the variations project, but the approach we've been taking at Northwestern is. Um, to have uh, uh, UUIDs generated. Uh, so every asset, we try not to rely too much on the file name to convey meaning because it's a 
very fragile way of describing content. So I think it, what we've, the experience we've had with our digital image library is that that has meaning to the creator. So we're trying to capture that and retain it in some way, the file name, but we can't use it as an identifier. So. Yeah, right now in, in release zero, the, the Fedora PID is really the, what is used to address a particular piece of content. Um, but <coughs> we probably need to talk more about identifier schemes and how we, how we support various ones that musicians may want to make use of. Any further questions? If not, I have one uh, myself, so I'll have to ask you. Get the microphone back so the folks at the back can, can hear more clearly. Um, I and colleagues uh, a, a while back were in, in, involved in, in, in building a, a video repository that was to suit the needs of, uh, of musical researchers, um, where for them they often saw their research outputs involved a video of uh, things like composers and performers working together to understand related issues. And they, Given that that was their research output, they wanted to be able to cite it, but they wanted to be able to cite not just the recording, but to be able to cite sections of it. Now, it's straightforward enough within the video to be able to put cue marks to do that, but, but it was non-trivial trying to provide a way to, to be able to directly essentially allow a URL to resolve to a particular point in that. Is that so, have you found the need to do that? And, and if so, do you think you're going to be able to develop a, a way to handle that? Oh, yeah, no, that absolutely, that's okay. a need. So, for example, in the existing uh, variation system, which doesn't support video, it does support audio and scores, uh, we have the ability to uh, construct a URL to, uh, that points to a specific time point or a specific uh, time segment uh, mm -hmm. within the audio. And so I think with this, we would plan to provide similar capability. And, and also, as I mentioned, looking at the, the, uh, the work of the OAC uh, project, um, which has, uh, I think, recommended use of, and I'm going to, uh, particularly W3C, Standard, who, which I'm forgetting right now. Yeah, so the W3C media project helps a little bit, right. but it's Can, yeah. not something you're about. It doesn't, yeah. Okay. But, but yeah, def that's definitely a requirement. But it's a step on the way, indeed, so it's a good thing. Okay, well, at that point, uh, let's say uh, we'll. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I have just one warning for you. I, I've reliably be inf been informed that the sun has come out. Uh, outside, so so do beware uh, of the power of its rays uh, if you do decide to go outside the building. And just to make clear, we've got about half an hour for coffee now.